everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Just one more reminder for folks just coming in that in the back of the room, the um, ETSU CME office has um, feedback forms for you to fill out and turn in at the end of today's Grand Rounds. Please also sign in to Grand Rounds using your mobile phone, and there are instructions at this back table here. And even if you do not require CME credit, we ask that you sign in. It helps us keep our accreditation for this series. So we are very fortunate to have an entire team of experts from um, both ETSU and the Northeast Regional Health Office here today to provide some education on Zika virus infection. I am going to um, turn things over to Dr. Bill Stone, um, who is going to introduce this team. Dr. Stone is professor in the ETSU Department of Pediatrics and has a PhD in um, molecular and cellular biology. Dr. Stone. Well, thank you. Uh, as Karen said, we're blessed to have three wonderful speakers today. I think when it, when it comes to talking about Zika, vi Zika virus, we have really two uh, guiding principles. Uh, one that you know about Murphy's Law, the everything that can go wrong will go wrong, wrong law. And probably the second, which you're not familiar with, uh, Smith's Law. Smith's Law is that Murphy was an optimist. Okay, so um, Our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Macariola. He's uh, infectious disease specialist. We're going to follow that by Rob Schobart, who's going to talk to us about the uh, Zika virus itself, followed up by uh, Dr. Kirschke, who's going to tell us about the uh, public health issues in Northeast Tennessee. So, we can carry over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stone, for the uh, introduction. Um, I was asked to talk about the clinical features of Zika virus you know, infection. But before we go into that, uh, let me just you know, talk about some uh, historical perspective of Zika virus infection. Uh, Zika virus infection was first described in 1947. You know, they, were, they were a group of scientists who were studying uh, a yellow fever you know, in uh, Uganda, Africa. And uh, at that time, they were able to isolate a virus from a macaque, you know, uh, monkey, you know. And the virus does not have the uh, molecular features of yellow virus in fact. <coughs> and uh, lo and behold, it turned out to be a Zika virus. You know, Zika is actually a Ugandan dialect term for overgrown. So, and overgrown in Ugandan dialect is called Zika. So they ended up naming this virus as Zika virus. So from, uh, in 1954, that was the very first time that a human Zika virus infection was first described on uh, someone uh, who, was, uh, who reside in uh, Nigeria. And from 1954 to 2015, there had been some sporadic you know, uh, cases of Zika virus infection all over the world. Now, the first major outbreak of Zika virus infection happened sometime in 2007 in a small Micronesian islands of Wiyap in the Southern Pacific, and it disappeared. And sometime in 2015, there were reported cases in Brazil, you know, and, uh, and, uh, those reported cases in Brazil spread to neighboring countries, including Caribbean. As we speak, and there had been some 50 countries all over the world that reported, you know, cases, you know, of Zika virus. So it is spreading, and I hope it doesn't spread here to Eastern Tennessee. Oops. Now, the mode of transmission. Uh, mainly, Zika virus is transmitted by a mosquito, by a female mosquito. And the species of mosquito that transmits Zika virus is Aedes you know, mosquito, especially Aedes aegypti mosquito, although potentially it can also be transmitted by Aedes albopectus. 
this species of mosquito are present uh, almost uh, almost in every state in the United States, if, not, if, if I'm not mistaken. It is present here in our area. It is present here in Johnson City area or in Eastern Tennessee area. So there's a potential that you know, we can, someone, you know, can develop a locally, you know, transmitted, you know, Zika virus infection in our community. Now, like I said, the major mechanism for, the, for someone to develop Zika virus infection is through a, through a bite of a female mosquito. Only female mosquito bite humans. You know, male don't, okay? So if a mosquito bit you, it's a, it's a female mosquito. It's a girl mosquito that is attractive to you, if you will. Yeah. So there are other ways that the uh, Zika virus can be transmitted. It can be transmitted intrauterine. It can also be transmitted by uh, sexual intercourse. That, um, in effect, you know, Zika virus infection is a sexually transmitted infection. So likewise, probably all this has not been proven yet, that Zika virus can also be a sexually transmitted infection in mosquitoes, just like your other viral infection that can be transmitted by your Aedes you know, mosquito. You know, I will not be surprised if, if, if it's going to be proven to be that way. Because for dengue virus, for lacrosse encephalitis virus, which are more or less virus that are harbored by Aedes aegypti, this type of virus infection are actually sexually transmitted among mosquitoes as well. You know. And likewise, it can also be transmitted by uh, blood transfusion. Now, let me just you know, describe how Zika virus spreads, spreads you know, in the community. And this is a uh, slide you know, that I downloaded from the CDC website. So, the uh, the character of the Aedes aegypti mosquito is actually is a domestic mosquito. It's, it's the type of mosquito that like to live inside houses. It's the type of mosquito that is going to bread, is, is going to go to your flower bases, and in effect, your flower bases will become the breeding places of this mosquito. So, those likewise, it can also. Uh, it can also breed, you know, outside, you know, your house, like if there is any stagnant water, like, you know, tires which, which can accumulate, you know, water or any stagnant water on the surrounding area of houses. And uh, this type of mosquito, uh, if, if it's going to travel, you know, from its habitat, it, it could travel between only 100 to 200 meters away, you know, from its main habitat. So if it lives in your house, more than likely until it dies, it's going to stay in your house. Yeah. And uh, so um, if the uh, mosquito will bite someone who is biremic, who is, or is having the Zika virus infection in the blood, then that mosquito is going to get infected, you know, with the Zika virus by itself. And as that mosquito bites other family members, you know, then that could be the way for the mosquito to spread, you know, all throughout the community. Most of the time, like I said, that the habitat of the mosquito is, or the mosquito only flies around 100 meters away from its main habitat, <coughs> that the main vector for widespread distribution of, of Zika virus are actually humans. Because for us humans, we could travel 100 miles away, or even 1,000 miles away. So most of the time, it's humans who is able to, uh, who is able to spread you know, this type of infections you know, at wide geographic areas. Now, what are the signs and symptoms? You know, most of the infection caused by Zika virus is asymptomatic. In fact, majority of infections are asymptomatic infections. Now, if symptoms are going to develop, what are the typical manifestations? It can cause fever, a maculopapular rash, arthralgia, and conjunctivitis. What did you notice with these uh, symptoms? Practically, 
you know, it's similar to a lot of viral, of viral infection. You know, so, you know, people can think that they're just having a regular or an ordinary viral infection, where in fact they're already having a Zika virus infection for that matter. Likewise, it can also be associated with uh, headache, you know, and uh, myalgia. Now, at times, on rare occasion, it can cause Guillain-Barre. In fact, Guillain-Barre is the most severe, you know, complication of Zika virus infection. And in intrauterine infections, bad things can happen. You know, it can cause microcephaly. Microcephaly happens because uh, this virus actually infects, you know, the brain parenchyma by itself. And likewise, it can cause intracranial calcification. So we should expand now if there's a history of traveling to Zika virus areas and there is intracranial calcification, then we should differentiate it from other, you know, infection, intrauterine infection that can cause intracranial calcification. And among them are uh, congenital CMB infection and toxoplasmosis. Likewise, it may also cause eye abnormalities, you know, such as, you know, cataracts. So it should be differentiated from congenital rubella syndrome, which can cause, you know, congenital cataract, you know, for that matter. Now, the, uh, the CDC had come up with, you know, certain, you know, clinical criteria when to suspect Zika virus infection during the first two weeks of life. And uh, uh, this, in that situation, if there is a maternal travel or history to an affected area within two weeks of delivery, and if there's going to be those ma clinical manifestation, then that will be the, the time or the situation that you have to suspect a Zika virus infection in your differential diagnosis. Likewise, for those you know, children who are uh, more than two weeks up to less than 18 years of age, less than years, 18 years of age, you know, the same thing. If there's a history of travel, you know, the past two weeks to those areas suspected to have Zika virus, and if they have manifestation of Zika virus infection, then Zika virus should also be part, you know, of the diagnosis. Now, what are the differential diagnoses? Like I said, you know, it can present like an ordinary viral infection. Now, uh, it should be differentiated from other viral infection that can be transmitted by a mosquito as well. So dengue virus should be on the differential. Chikungunya virus should also, should also be on the differential as well. Now, um, there are common infection, bacterial or viral, that can mimic you know, Zika virus. Among them is um, group A strep. So the strep you know, bacteria that can cause pharyngitis, you know, should be on the differential, mainly because it can cause fever, it can cause rashes, you know. And likewise, you know, rubella, parvovirus, enterovirus, and adenovirus as well. I would like to caution, though, that you only have to put, you only have to consider Zika virus in the differential if there is a travel history. Without travel history, then you know, it should, it, uh, it's unlikely that you might be dealing with a Zika virus infection. Now, there are other infections that can also mimic, you know, Zika virus. Among them are Leptospira infection, Rickettsia, and Alpha virus, you know, infection. Now, how do we test for <coughs> Zika virus? You know, we can do a uh, PCR test and sero serologic test. PCR test can be positive even a week or one to two weeks after developing the infection, while serologic tests such as, immun uh, such as Zika virus serologic test immunoglobulin M, usually it becomes positive two to 12 weeks after developing the infection. Okay, so treatment, you know, treatment are supportive, you know, fluids, analgesic, and antipyretics. Avoid aspirin for that matter because like I said, a dengue is one of the differential, and if you're, if you're dealing with dengue infection, you know, sometimes dengue infection can cause uh, um, uh, DIC, you know, or uh, thrombocytopenia. So that's the reason why you don't want to give someone which you are suspecting 
with uh, Zika virus to, to be given aspirin until the time that you're going to be ruled out, you know, dengue infection for that matter. So um, uh, that ends my uh, talk about the clinical features of uh, Zika virus. I'm going to turn over now the, uh, the podium to Dr. Schubert for the molecular aspect of the Zika virus infection. Thank you. We'll hold questions until the uh, three speakers are finished. Hopefully this is actually working. <clears throat> okay, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I know everyone in the room probably has other things that they could be doing. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, and I know there's a number of people in the room who do because I recognize them because they're former medical students of mine. Uh, but my name is Rob Schoberg. I'm in the Department of Biomedical Sciences. And I teach, among other things, immunology and virology uh, in the second year medical curriculum here at Quillen. And what I'm going to talk about, hopefully, it's, it's not really about the clinical aspects of the disease. That has already been really well covered. What I'm basically going to talk a little bit about is the structure and replication of this virus and how that might allow us to identify potential therapeutic targets. Okay. You already know now that there, there isn't any specific antiviral therapy for Zika. There's no vaccine. And what I hope to do is give you some hope that in the near future there might be. Okay, so there are my disclosures. I don't have any uh, conflict of interest. <clears throat> and I want to start with the learning objective. So basically what I would like you to be able to do after I'm done is describe a little bit about how basic science investigation of the molecular biology of Zika might identify new vaccine and drug targets. Maybe discuss a little bit about potential targets for small molecule inhibitors of Zika. And this is really analogous to the situation in hepatitis C virus right now in terms of the new treatments. And also think or discuss a little bit about the targets in Zika potentially for neutralizing antibodies that could be used to engineer a vaccine sometime in the future. Now, I don't have to really do any of this overview, okay, because it's already been done. But one thing I do want to mention is that Zika virus is in the family Flaviviridae, okay, and it's related, pretty closely related in structure and replication to yellow fever virus that we have a vaccine for, also to West Nile and dengue, and to some other viruses like hepatitis C that, again, we are developing new antiviral therapies for. So the nice thing about having a vaccine for yellow fever, having therapies for HCV, is that because they're related viruses, we can use that information to try to develop new therapeutics and or vaccines for this virus. It doesn't mean we're going to be able to do it. It just gives us some helpful things to look at. So okay, I like to ask, anybody that's had one of my courses knows I like to ask questions. So why do we care? Somebody tell me why we care. Why do we care about Zika? Anybody? Come on. Come on. Yeah, in the back. Anyone? OK. Yes, it causes birth defects. That is true. Congenital Zika syndrome. So it's not just microcephaly. It's other things, too. OK. But again, why do we specifically care about it now? Because it's happening, okay? Yeah, because there, there's outbreaks in, US, in, in this hemisphere, in the, in the U.S. territories, in Puerto Rico, and there's local transmission in Florida and the United States. So that's why we care, because it's happening now and because of the potential for congenital Zika syndrome and for Guillain-Barre. So that, I mean, otherwise, most of the time, it's either asymptomatic or a fairly trivial infection. So what I want to start with is the structure. And one of the things I want to point out is that because this Zika outbreak, the big Zika outbreak, just started happening in the last couple of years, there hasn't been a huge amount of laboratory studies done on the structure and replication specifically of this virus. 
So a lot of what I'm going to tell you and a lot of what we know is by analogy to other related viruses. And most of the studies to this point, um, except for a few differences in the replication, suggest that Zika virus is quite a bit like the other flavivirinae. So this basically is a little cartoon showing, let's see if I can get a little, uh, the laser pointer to work, showing a little cartoon showing the structure of the virus. So this virus, like all of the other flaviviruses, is a single-stranded RNA virus that is of positive polarity. So inside of the virus, you have a single-stranded RNA genome that is found within an icosahedral protein capsid. And that protein capsid is surrounded by a lipid bilayer envelope that is obtained from the host cell when the virus replicates. And one of the things I want to point out is that in that envelope you have two proteins. Actually, have, you actually have three proteins, but the two important ones are called E1 and E2. Stands for, very cleverly, envelope protein 1, envelope protein 2. Envelope protein 1 is the protein that helps the virus get into the cytoplasm of the host cell. Envelope protein 2, or E2, is the protein that binds to the host cell receptor. And that's incredibly important because as you'll see on the next slide, Zika virus, like other viruses, is an obligate intracellular parasite or obligate intracellular pathogen. What does that mean? I know people out there can tell me what that means. It needs a host cell to replicate, so it's not like a lot of other pathogens that you might see in the hospital, you know, staph and strep and mycobacteria and things like that, that can be grown on auger plates. This particular pathogen needs a, a host cell to replicate in. And so this is a little cartoon of its replication cycle in a host cell. So the first thing that this virus does is it attaches, it attaches to a receptor. And cell culture studies have identified a number of different potential receptors for this virus, but none of them have been absolutely confirmed, so I'm not going to tell you what they are, and it's not really important for the talk anyway. But that's the first step. Virus that E2 protein in the envelope has to attach to host cell receptor. If that doesn't happen, none of the rest of this stuff happens. So if you prevent attachment of the virus to its host cell, you prevent infection and you prevent disease. So then the virus comes in. It's actually endocytosed into the cytoplasm of the host cell. And that E1 protein mediates a fusion event between the viral envelope and the endosome, which expels the viral RNA into the cytoplasm. That viral RNA then goes to the rough endoplasmic reticulum for most of the flaviviruses. But there's some evidence that suggests that Zika is weird, and that it might actually replicate in the nucleus. But that, again, that hasn't really been confirmed. And so for our purposes, it's just like the other flavies. Now, once it gets to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the first thing that happens to the genomic RNA is it gets translated to produce this gigantic polyprotein. It makes one big protein. That protein is then cleaved by cellular and viral proteases into its functional subunits, like RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, like capsid proteins and envelope proteins. That big polyprotein is not functional for anything in viral replication. You have to cut it up with the proteases to make all the functional subunits. If you don't do that, the virus is stalled in its replication and, again, cannot complete this process. Does that make sense? So if you prevent entry, you prevent replication. If you prevent protease cleavage of this giant polyprotein, you prevent replication. If you inhibit the viral polymerase that gets made by this cleavage, you prevent replication. Nothing else will happen. And then, of course, some magic occurs. The genome gets replicated. The virus basically assembles at the endoplasmic reticulum and buds into the ER and then exits the cell by exocytosis. Now, this diagram is misleading because it shows one virus coming in, one virus goes out. Is that what happens? No. One virus goes in, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of viruses come out. And those spread to new cells and they replicate. And Replications in the cell by many of these flaviviruses is lytic. It actually kills the host cell. So that causes tissue damage. Also, the replication of the virus in the tissue, production of interferon, things like that, causes inflammation. If that's out of control, it's not a good thing. It's a good thing when it controls the infection. It's a bad thing when it damages tissue. 
Okay. Well, I want to focus a little bit more on some specifics in the replication of the virus. So again, as I mentioned before, that viral genomic RNA gets, at very first when it starts to replicate, gets translated by ribosomes to make this big, giant polyprotein. And this big, giant polyprotein, you can see this little kind of ribbon diagram on the bottom. It gets inserted through the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and it gets cleaved by host proteases, like signal peptidase. What's a protease, by the way? Everybody know what a protease is? It's an enzyme that cuts proteins. Okay. So it gets cleaved by signal peptidase, by Golgi protease, and by several viral proteases. And you need all of those cleavages to produce all of the different proteins that allow the virus to replicate. Okay, so I just told you, Zika polyprotein cleavage requires both host and viral proteases. And so, because that's required for replication, inhibition or of those proteases should stop replication, right? So you could use that as a drug, maybe. So you develop a small molecule inhibitor of those proteases, and that should inhibit virus replication. Everybody goes, yay, we have a drug. So I have a question for you. Would developing an inhibitor of the host proteases that are involved in that process work as well. So just who thinks yes and who thinks no? So who thinks yes? Would that work? Would that prevent virus replication? Yeah, probably. Okay, yeah. Okay. The host protease cleavages are required to make those final functional proteins, so are the viral ones. So you could make drugs that inhibit the host proteases as well. But why might that not be as good? Yeah, you need those proteases to do other things. So if you make a, a drug that targets and inhibits the host function, you're, you may have lots and lots of side effects to that drug that might not be a good drug to use. But if you can specifically target the viral enzyme, as we've done with HIV, as we've done with hepatitis C, then you might get a lower amount of side effects. It's going to depend upon how much that drug inhibits other cellular proteases, you know, host proteases as well. <clears throat> and I just want to use real quick the example of hepatitis C because it makes a great example. Uh, how many people in here have been involved in treating hepatitis C at some point in their career? Okay, there's a few people. The treatments that were used maybe five or six years ago pegylated interferon and ribavirin are not great treatments. They're not great therapies. They don't work all the time. They have lots of side effects. You have to treat for a long time. It's really expensive. Just a lot of, I mean, it's better than losing your liver to hepatitis C, but not great. So in the last four or five years, uh, these other drugs for treating hepatitis C have started to come out that are called direct acting antivirals. And basically, what happened is people studied hep C replication, they studied the structure of the enzymes, what their substrates were, what the active sites are, you know, all that horrible stuff that you learn about in the first two years of medical school and then you completely forget about, okay? Basically companies and NIH funded researchers were able, able to use structure based drug design to develop drugs that fit in the active sites of those enzymes and prevent their activity. And they work really well, much better, much lower side effects, much higher sustained rate of getting rid of the virus than the previous therapies. The biggest problem is they're really expensive. But HCV, because it's related and has many of the same similar functions to Zika, provides a nice template or a nice model that we could use to say, well, okay, maybe we can do that same thing and, and make inhibitors of Zika virus protease or Zika virus polymerase or all of these other enzymes that the virus uses for its replication. Okay, so that's the drug part. The next thing I want to mention is, is everybody familiar with the concept of a neutralizing antibody? Okay, so when you're infected uh, with a virus, perhaps like Zika, probably the, one of the better examples is yellow fever virus, you produce, among other parts of your immune response, a neutralizing antibodies. And those neutralizing antibodies can bind to the surface proteins on the, on the surface of the virus and actually prevent the virus from binding its receptor, as is shown in this little figure here. So we'll pretend this is Zika virus or yellow fever. And you have these antibodies that bind to the surface. 
keep it from binding the receptor, and if you keep it from binding the receptor, it can't replicate, it's done. And we've been able to do this. We have a, we have a very effective live attenuated yellow fever virus vaccine okay, that elicits, among other things, cell-mediated immunity and neutralizing antibodies that can protect you from infection with the virus. And the nice thing about a vaccine as, as opposed to a, a, thera a drug is that it can protect both an individual and it can protect a population by inducing herd immunity. Okay? And it's also a preventative rather than a treatment, so you don't wait until you know someone's infected to use it. So even though it's much harder in many ways to develop vaccines than, than uh, antiviral drugs, although developing antiviral drugs is not easy, um, you know, there is some hope in, in the future for developing a, a vaccine for Zika that is similar perhaps to the yellow fever virus vaccine, which again is pretty effective. Okay, so basically to wrap up, I just want to point out again that that Zika E2 protein, that, that's the protein that attaches to the receptor, uh, could be used to elicit neutralizing antibodies in patients. There's actually quite a bit of evidence that suggests that, number one, Zika does not produce chronic infection, which, which indicates that an infected individual does produce an effective immune response, and that you don't get Zika twice, which is good news for developing a vaccine because what it says, at least in the context of natural infection, that it's possible to get a protective immune response. Okay? We may not be able to make a vaccine that does it, but we might be able to as well. And, of course, there's lots of different potential uh, viral enzymes that we could target for drugs. Uh, again, the proteases, the two proteases that do a lot of those cleavages, NS3 and NS4A, would be really nice uh, targets, but we could also target polymerases and other viral enzymes. And then finally, the ex our experience with hepatitis C may help us do this. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Okay, so I was just going to talk about some of the public health aspects of what's been going on in Tennessee so far. And I actually have some slides for people to see, so I'm going to skip through a couple of things. One thing I wanted to point out is that um, viruses that are transmitted by Aedes aegypti are not new to Tennessee. So uh, you may have heard about the yellow fever outbreak in Memphis in 1878. Uh, 5,000 people died, was transmitted by Aedes aegypti, same mosquito that primarily transmits Zika virus. Um, of course, we haven't seen any yellow fever around here for a long time, which means you know our mosquito disease has been mostly under control. Um, so, if if you do encounter a patient um, that you that you think may have Zika, um, as mentioned by Dr. Macriola, um, you need to figure out if they've traveled somewhere or had some uh, some other exposure to Zika. You can figure out the countries that currently have Zika, pretty much the whole uh, southern hemisphere, um, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, and then some areas of Miami. Uh, but you can go to CDC website and find a map and list of places uh, that has occurred. You can also call the health department. We can help you out if you're trying to figure it out. Um, in terms of where the mosquitoes that can transmit it occur, they do occur in Tennessee. So we think we primarily have Aedes albopictus, um, which uh, theoretically can transmit Zika. Um, it's unclear how well it transmits it. Um, we know we have some Aedes aegypti, but we don't have good data because no one's doing surveillance for these mosquitoes. So we don't have good data for how much Aedes aegypti we have in Tennessee. Um, so there's been over 3,000 travel-associated cases in the U.S., lab-confirmed cases, so there's probably many more. So um, as we heard earlier, 80% of Zika virus infections are asymptomatic, so a lot of those people aren't going to be diagnosed. And then among people that have symptomatic infections, some of those may not get tested. Um, so it's probably a little bit of the tip of the iceberg. 
Um, 95 locally acquired cases in Miami. That means that they acquired the infection in Miami primarily through mosquitoes. So someone traveled, came back, got bit by a mosquito. Actually, mosquitoes can't immediately transmit the virus. It takes about a week um, for them to, for the virus to grow inside them and get into the salivary gland so that they can uh, bite someone and transmit it. Um, but then we think they can transmit it for the rest of their life cycle, which is um, six or eight weeks. Um, so, so that's what's been occurring in Miami-Dade. They've been doing a lot of mosquito control activities to try to get that under control. Also, there's been documentation of sexually transmitted Zika virus in the U.S. So someone travels, comes back, has sex with a partner. It can be sexually transmitted from a male to a female, female to a male, male to a male. Um, there's been eight documented cases of Guillain-Barre. Um, 749 pregnant women have been con lab confirmed with Zika virus in the U.S. Um, 20 of the live-born babies had birth defects. It can also cause loss of pregnancy. Um, and that's been documented as well in the U.S. In Tennessee, we've had uh, 51 lab-confirmed cases of Zika virus. Um, in our region, so the seven counties in northeast Tennessee that I cover, we've had two lab-confirmed cases. And again, probably more, more people have had Zika that just never got tested. Um, in Tennessee, we've had no local transmission that's been documented. Um, we haven't documented any sexual transmission, um, although it may have occurred. Um, and then we've not had any microcephaly in Tennessee. Um, we are, you may have noticed um, that we are, microcephaly is now a reportable disease, um, like gonorrhea and other things. So we're trying to get a baseline of how much microcephaly, no one really knew before this outbreak came, how much microcephaly we really see every year. So we're trying to get a baseline just so we can detect any increase in microcephaly that might be attributable to this. Um, So testing, um, we do testing through the state laboratory for Zika virus. Um, it's also available commercially. Um, so if you have someone that doesn't qualify, and I'll tell you what the, who we test at the state lab, but if you have someone that doesn't meet our testing criteria, they can still get tested at LabCorp or Quest, um, does those tests as well. So who we're interested in testing, uh, pregnant females with possible travel-related or sexual exposure to Zika. So any pregnant woman, whether she's symptomatic or not, that's either traveled um, or had sex with someone that's traveled. Um, also, any symptomatic males or females that have appropriate travel history or sexual exposure. Um, any children uh, that are less than two weeks old whose mom was possibly exposed um, and, the, and the infant has symptoms associated with Zika. I noticed on the CDC website they say arthralgia, which I'm not sure how you tell that in a two-week-old. Um, but uh, And then any infant with abnormal clinical or neuroimaging suggestive of Zika congenital syndrome and the mom was possibly exposed. Uh, let's see. Um, I think we covered most of this. So... Um, you know, these symptoms caused by a virus aren't new. You know, the reason we vaccinate against rubella is because of congenital rubella syndrome. And there's a lot of analogies. Not the viruses aren't related, but they cause a lot of the same syndromes. Pregnancy loss, microcephaly, um, mental retardation, hearing and vision problems. Um, so talk some things we know about, uh, we talked about this already, some things that we know about Zika, possibility of blood transfusions. Um, so there's now the recommendation to test all donated blood by PCR for Zika virus. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this that we've talked about already. Um, so there are some unanswered questions. Um, so what are the effects of Zika virus on the adult brain? Um, so there's been some reports of meningoencephalitis. Um, there's been a rat study that shows that it can damage normal brains, but it's unknown what, what that means for other adults. So far, you know, in the large outbreak, there's not been any documentation of problems with healthy adults um, besides the acute infection. Um, 
So there are currently there's vaccines in development. Um, how great a role does sexual transmission play in an outbreak? So currently, it looks like most of the um, outbreaks are caused by mosquito transmission. But you know, what role does sexual transmission play? There's not been any documented large sexual transmit sexually transmitted outbreaks. Um, so are there different risks for birth defects due to sexual transmission during pregnancy versus mosquito-borne transmission? Um, maybe or maybe not. Um, can testing of body fluids be used uh, to predict transmission? So um, for males, they've we, there's some ongoing studies to see how long the virus persists in different body fluids. Like semen, it's been documented for 93 days, I think. Um, that so Zika can persist in the semen. So, which leads to the recommendation that, um, you know, a symptomatic male should abstain from unprotected sex for, avoid unprotected sex for uh, six months at least. Um, so, we talked about some of the other things there. Um, so what is the relative risk of transmission between Aedes aegypti mosquitoes and Aedes, Aedes albopictus? At this point, it's unclear. Um, also, as I said, it's unclear the relative proportions of those mosquitoes in our area. I know we have Aedes albopictus. Uh, just in my yard the other day, I was out and kind of in our doing some yard work, and I killed four Aedes albopictus um, just within a few minutes while I was doing yard work. Um, So again, there are some vaccines that, there's actually one vaccine that's already in human trials um, and several vaccines in the pipeline. Wanted to talk about prevention. Um, so for all travelers that travel to a Zika affected area, so any of those other countries or Miami or Puerto Rico, um, we ask that even if they're asymptomatic, they avoid mosquitoes for three weeks after their return to prevent possible local transmission. Um, and then avoid unprotected sex for at least eight weeks, and that's male or female, and that's asymptomatic people. Um, an infected male, so someone that has symptomatic infection um, or has documented lab-confirmed Zika virus, a male should avoid unprotected sex for six months. An infected female or symptomatic female should avoid unprotected sex for eight weeks. Um, and then a pregnant female with an exposed partner um, should avoid unprotected sex for the duration of the pregnancy. Um, currently, CDC says that uh, an infected woman does not have to um, abstain from breastfeeding. Um, there's not been documentation of that transmission, although it's theoretically possible because Zika has been found in breast milk. Um, but they think that currently that the um, benefits of breastfeeding outweigh the risk of developing Zika virus infection. Um, I will say that we, like I said, we've had two local cases of Zika virus. Um, the public health response is that we contact anyone that we know has lab confirmed Zika. We do a home visit to look for mosquito habitat. Um, we educate the person about avoiding mosquitoes, why they're symptomatic, to help prevent local transmission. We also educate them about sexual transmission. Um, and then uh, currently we're doing what we call a local response. So we're actually going in a 200 yard radius around their house and uh, educating all the people in those houses about avoiding mosquitoes, um, telling them, you know, for the next eight weeks, report any symptoms consistent with Zika virus for testing. And if it's a pregnant woman, to let their OB know. Uh, and there may need to be serial um, testing of the pregnant woman. Uh, to make sure there's not uh, infection. Um, so I think I'll stop there so we have time for questions. Do you have questions? Well, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. For the fantastic <laughs> and let's do open things up to questions right now, please. I think everyone was very thorough. I've got a question for you. Do, do we know any of the structures of the Zika viral protein yet, where we can look at the structure and kind of build models? I, I, so the question is about the, the structure of the Zika virus proteins or enzymes. Um, last time I looked, which was probably 
two or three weeks ago. I didn't find anything on, you know, that they have crystal structures, yeah. but they certainly have, you know, ribbon predictive structures okay. based upon the structures of other floppy virus proteins. So I would expect, um, you know, candidate drugs to start coming out pretty rapidly. Yeah, thank you to the speakers and thank you to Dr. Tell for putting this together. Sure. David, what are the characteristics of this disease that cause it to spread so rapidly? I mean, it just swept across Latin America and now up in the, within a year. Are there, are, there, are there models of this that explain the rapid spread of this? Yeah, no, you know, it was fairly analogous to what happened with chikungunya two years ago. Um, so chikungunya had kind of been similar story, had been smoldering, you know, in Asia for, you know, you know, 50 years or something like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, it just took off when it hit the <coughs> Western Hemisphere. And we had outbreaks in the Caribbean that, you know, eventually, then we had a lot of travel-related cases in our area of people that traveled to places where there's chikungunya virus. Um, I don't know that there's anything that happened with the virus itself, but, you know, I think it just um, got into an area with a lot of, you know, 80s mosquitoes and a huge, you know, in Brazil, the big outbreak in Brazil in 2015 with Zika virus um, and a lot of susceptible hosts, potential hosts, um, and took off. Um, the, other th the, th the other thing is with Zika was that, the, you know, microcephaly and things like that, and, you know, since the 50s when it was discovered, there hadn't been a, an association made with microcephaly. Um, so it's unclear whether it was just a, such a large outbreak in Brazil um, where they're able to see an increase in microcephaly during the outbreak and put two and two together and figure out the connection, um, whereas you just had sporadic cases in Asia and Africa for all those years. Um, but there, there, is some, there is some precedence for that too. So with West Nile virus, <laughs> You know, for all the time West Nile virus was going around in Asia, in, uh, Asia and Europe, um, there wasn't the, you know, neurological problems found. But then when we had the big outbreak uh, in the U.S., all of a sudden there's these neurological problems. So, um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think there's, it's fully explained why. Do they think there's any relationship between changes in climate, uh, in terms of warming of the climate, uh, with the spread of the mosquito, or... Yeah, so I'm not sure with in terms of like the big outbreak in Brazil, but certainly in the U.S. Um, it could come into play. So, and you know, everyone always predicted that Miami would be the, or you know, South Florida at least would be the first place to have local transmission in the U.S. of Zika virus uh, because they have year-round um, 80s um, mosquito activity, um, whereas you know, further north, like Tennessee, we have largely no mosquitoes during the winter time. Um, so, additional question? And mine's a related question. I mean, I, I think we're all sort of grappling with why now? Why suddenly is there such a huge outbreak when we know it's been around for some time? Is yeah. there anything in the African subcontinent that genetically or from the existence of malaria or other things that may protect them from it becoming such a rapid spread of disease? And then you know, that protective factor is not there when you hit South America or... Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we know the answer. You know, it might have just been around there so long that you had enough people that became immune to it where it wasn't spreading a lot. Whereas, like I said, when it hit Brazil, you know, basically no one was immune to it. And same in the U.S., you know, we don't have pre any pre-existing immunity. And why did it take so many years to hit Brazil? Yeah, it's really unclear. Um, you know, there's some speculation. You know, they had that outbreak in 2007, I think it was, in, um, you know, yeah, Micronesia in the Pacific. Um, and then some people think it was spread from there to Brazil um, in 2015 by some pre-Olympic activities where there's a lot of people, like, canoeing and things like that. So a lot of people from the Pacific came to Brazil for, um, like, the year before the Olympics. They have all these warm-up events. Um, and someone potentially could have brought it at that time, and it just... You know, hit, hit all those susceptible population with a lot of mosquitoes and uh, took off. But it's all, it's mostly speculation. We also have to take into account that it's easy to travel nowadays from one corner of the world to the other. You know, within hours, we can be here in Eastern Tennessee, and then in six hours, we could be in uh, Africa yeah. or in 
Central America, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So with that, you know, it, you know, for infectious disease for that matter can spread, you know, mm -hmm. in a matter, you know, of days, you know, or weeks, you know, where it used to be, it, it would take years. Yeah. So they're going to spread from one corner of the world to the other. Yeah, good point. And we have a lot of people from this area that travel to, um, I think, so you're going to Belize here in a couple days. Um, we have a lot of mission groups during the summer, church groups. With chikungunya virus, you know, one of our bigger outbreaks was a group that went to Haiti, um, and I think it was 2014, um, a church group. Um, so yeah, travel, travel was a big part of it for sure. Yeah, so um, currently it looks like um, previous Zika virus infection does not affect future pregnancies. Um, I have not heard a time frame for that. Um, certainly I probably wouldn't recommend trying to get pregnant before like 48 weeks after, after infection, but um, I think that's kind of one of the still unknown uh, areas. But it does not look like uh, previous, after you clear the infection, that um, there's still a risk. Yeah, so um, at least for microcephaly, the first trimester looks like the worst. It looks like about 1% of pregnancies um, can be affected by birth defects and other things. 1% um, of Zika-infected uh, mothers. Um, so first trimester is the worst for microcephaly, although there was a New England Journal of Medicine article that looked at um, some cases in Brazil where even in the third trimester, you could have things like... Um, uh, loss of pregnancy, they had oligohydramnios and other problems with the pregnancy that developed um, even, even by late third trimester infections with Zika virus. Um, and then, you know, really late, you know, if you're infected within a couple weeks of delivery, you could uh, have congenital infection of the baby. So the baby born with Zika virus. I know they've been doing some spraying with the it looks like it's been effective, although obviously there's been a lot of uh, concern about, you know, from people about the chemicals and things they use. So they've been using something called NALID, um, and then also a uh, biologic agent, so Bacillus thuringiensis, um, which is those, you can buy them at Lowe's and things, those dunks that you put in um, if you have fish ponds and things like that at your house. Um, but, you know, at least initial reports is that the vector control has been helpful in it. Um, the environmental things, you know, we don't know what the environmental impact will be necessarily. Um, there was some spraying done in South Carolina. You probably saw these reports where it killed a bunch of bees and things like that. So, uh, I think it's important for people to kind of weigh the risks and benefits. At least in South Carolina, I don't, you know, there wasn't any suggestion of imminent or you know, local transmission or anything like that when they did the spring there. And I was going to ask about the South Carolina bees because I think there was a lot of talk about it and the question of the level of spring and was the spring, you know, why previous springs had to kill the bees but this kind of wiped them all out. Yeah, I don't have any additional information on that. Um, at least locally what we're recommending to, um, so we've met with all the mayors and things like that locally. Um, so there's not all of our communities have pre-existing mosquito control programs like spraying and things like that. Um, but we encourage the mayors to develop plans to hire contractors to do it if we were to get local transmission, um, but not necessarily to start doing it before that happens. Um, but so there are some communities that already do spraying, which spraying only kills adult mosquitoes that happen to be flying when the truck comes by. Um, so you also have to, for mosquito control, you have to do a number of things, so larvicide, so actually putting insecticide into water and things where the mosquitoes breed to kill the larvae and things like that. So, um, but we have had uh, ongoing talks with um, counties and city mayors um, to help them develop plans if, if there was to be local transmission. If not... Well, actually, the last thing I'll say is if, if you do want to test through the state lab, um, it has to be approved either by myself or by um, our communicable disease nurse. 
Um, so you could just call the health department. Um, so call the regional or local health department and you can get a hold of us. Um, there's a form that we'll give you to fill out um, on the patient. Um, and then it includes instructions on how to get the sample sent to the state lab. So if they meet the criteria. Right. Thank you all. Thank you everyone for the great questions.